two-person mechanics today. I do want to mention, as we start, the new official's manual. For those of you who are on our Facebook group, I put a picture of this when I got it. It is new. It is big. Here's the, this is last year's rules book, but the size is way different. Wow. And it's a lot thicker. Yeah. It's a lot thicker. So I say, well, wait, why is it so much thicker? Why is it so much bigger? The print's not really that much bigger, but they put lots of, lots of pictures, lots of, you know, pictograms explaining. They've completely uh, rearranged how they describe it. It's no longer the same format. It's really better put together, I think. And um, Federation did a nice job with that. So <coughs> you haven't gotten a manual in a while. Um, now's the time, I think. Um, and it's all, everything we're going to talk about today is all in there. Um, let's get the first video up. What should we start with? All right. Three point shot play. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're talking about mechanics here. Watch uh, as much as you can, both officials. Yes, it's an inbound, but I'm looking at the three point shot. Did we do this correctly or incorrectly? I must say the trailer. You see both from incorrectly. Mm -hmm. Trail should only mirror when it's when it's a goal when they okay. score the three. So who's going to who's going to give the initial three point attempt signal on this? Lead, lead, lead because it's Leeds area, so it's Leeds line, correct? Absolutely. Yes. Yep. yep. Okay. So which the lead does, and only the lead will signal this. Okay, and this goes for any three-point attempt in the trails area is the same. Only the trail would signal. When you ever you have a three-point attempt, you only have one official signaling the attempt. Right? Absolutely. What I I had when I was doing the AAU game, I had one official tell me now I was right down near where he is. And I held up for the three pointer and he's going to tell me that I wasn't supposed to hold up my hand. He was supposed to do it because that's what he, because he's outside. And I was like, what? Okay. So that's actually, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Derek, because in three person, the lead isn't responsible for any three point line and the lead never signals, right? That's right. right. But it's not the same for two person. You cannot expect the trail to cover the entire three point line. It's just impossible. There's no way they can get a good enough look. You know, this plays easy. They're not close to the line, but if they're close to it, uh, we can't tell if they're on the line or away from the line. So the lead has to signal in a two person game. If the ball goes in, or we already talked about, we don't mirror the attempt. If the ball goes in yes. and the lead gave the signal, the first signal, the lead has to give the successful signal as well. Again, same goes for the trail. If you give the attempt signal, then you must give the successful signal. You are the ruling official on whether it was the, uh, a proper attempt and whether it was a proper successful basket. It's all you, okay? So I'm going to give the mm. this official the credit. He kind of half did it and then put his arm down. But we're going to say he did it. And in this case, the trail will mirror the lead's signal. Why does the trail mirror the lead signal? If the, if the, the table knows. That's right. The lead is, is ruling and telling everybody, but the trail is in position for everybody to see clearly, the table clearly. So there's no confusion okay. as to whether there was or was not. Okay, but don't forget, if you're the lead and you signal, first you must signal the, the attempt in your area, but you have to signal the successful as well. Everybody good with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. 
All what's right. what's what's the harm in mirroring the attempt out front? That's a good question. I, I don't really know what the harm is. Go ahead, Jack. You're watching the ball instead of watching your area. Well, if you're just mirroring a signal, oh, I could be the same. You know, I mean, I I guess if you're saying you're just mirroring, but I think I think to um, your point, it just means you're not focused on your area, and and if you are seeing them. Maybe you see it out of the corner of your eye, but you're asking them, then you're not watching where you're supposed to be watching. I guess that's a that's a good explanation. Okay. Um, let me see if I have another. Let's try this one. Primary coverage areas in a two-person game. We all know the primary coverage areas. Yes. The trail has a ton to watch. Why do they give the trail so much to watch? Anybody? Pure players. Because most of the action, a lot of bodies underneath, usually. So correct. Most of the physical play is going to happen in the paint area. Strong side, typically, balls coming in. Post players are banging, and so there's less physical play, and not always, but less physical play in the trails area. So they give the trail a little bit more to watch, um, because the lead is typically going to have a lot to watch in their small area. All right. So here we've got a trail play. Yes. Definitely the trails area. Definitely the trails ruling. And their focus is right here. Right? The primary focus is the ball and its matchup. And they're also probably going to be looking through that play to see those players down just below the trails primary coverage area. Why? Why does the trail know he should kind of see that play? It's not in his area. He shouldn't have to watch them, right? From where the trail is standing, which I think the trail needs to come over, maybe not quite that far, but it needs to come over to see that play. You can't ref that play from the other side of the court. Do we agree? Yep. I agree with you, but it doesn't happen. But <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, you're correct, but it should happen. But that then means out of your peripheral, you can't see those six other players there, right? Or at least it's very difficult. So who has to watch those players? The lead yeah. has to recognize I've got two players in my area and they're not really doing anything. And the trail is watching at the top of the key way over. I need to come and help out with these players. They're not in the leads area, but the lead has to do change their focus to help cover all of the players on the court. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yes. But Josh, my question is to you, at that point, would he change his position at the, at the bottom there, come over a little bit? Um, no, because that's called ball side mechanics. And you only do, at least according to the book, you only come over when the ball is on the opposite side of the lead. And the trail is also watching at the top of the key and has his, focus off does that make sense yes okay. i might have a clip of that i don't remember if i found that or not so if we do we'll talk about that some more yeah doesn't he have to keep his eye on the sideline though i mean if he's changing his primary focus there he's gonna lose the sideline if the ball should hit out oh, really oh. fast yes so he is still in charge of his sideline and needs to be aware of that okay but what if the ball I don't have this on this clip, but what if the ball gets tipped and goes out of the sideline right where the player who's holding the ball is at? Who's probably going to see that the best? Trail. 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 So the trail's probably going to help on almost all out-of-bounds situations. You know, maybe not a stepping on the line if he steps there. He's not going to probably be able to help with that. But almost all out-of-bounds situations up this high, the trail can always help. Now, the trail's not going to signal for the lead because it's the lead's line, correct? But if the lead doesn't know, they'll look to the trail and the trail can tell them. Okay, so when I say change your focus, your primary focus, we're always going to have this secondary focus as well. We cannot just ignore the other players. We have to know that they're there and be aware of what they're doing in case they do step on the line or an illegal screen is set and my the partner didn't look at it because they were watching something else. Okay. Gosh. Yes. 
one of the clues I use for when to change the focus, I try and see where my partner's eyes are. Just glance, where is he looking? Okay, I've got to look elsewhere. It's a good cue, um, but I be careful doing that. You don't want to find yourself watching your partner, right? Oh, I, I just that, take a quick, I take a quick look. Yeah, I know you're not, I know that's not what you're suggesting, but I want to make sure everyone knows. Oh yeah, okay, that's great. Well, watch where my partner's looking. But then you get caught up just looking at your partner and now you're watching your partner and not the players. So that's a good idea. Just make sure that we're aware. We take a quick look. I take my cue on what is the position of my partner? Where is my partner standing? He's over pretty far. Now maybe you see that he's there and you can take a quick glance of where he's looking. Mm -hmm. Especially in this scenario here where no one's really doing anything. Do we agree? Yeah. It's developing, but no one's really yeah. banging into a spot yet. You've got some off-ball screens behind where he's not looking. Possibly coming. I agree. Hey, John. Like, yes, sir. What, what, what do you think of the position of the trail in this case? Because he's standing in the middle of the floor. I personally think, and the rules book does not say how far over you can come. Actually, it might say up to the center of the court. Again, they've rewritten this, so there's words in there that I don't remember. But for me, personally... I'm not coming over that far. I'm going to mm -hmm. step on maybe the bottom of that circle furthest from the table. I think that's about as far as I need to come to be able to properly see that play. And the reason I'm not going to come that far is if that ball gets kicked over the other way quickly, you're kind of in the way of everybody. What if it gets stolen and comes right at you? You're right in the middle of the court. You right. could be in the way of play. Then you got to take a charge. <laughs> some some clinicians have given the thought of breaking down the court into thirds and not and not being more than a the next lane over and i think that's the philosophy this guy was utilizing but to your point that ball gets turned over um there's a bunch of bulls coming at you yeah, yeah. and and i would say if you're on the edge of that second third i think you're far enough now, again, everyone has a different comfort level, and I don't think there's anything specifically written as to how far you can come over. But in a two-person game, as we all know, we do not rotate positions, right? So he can't, like, walk all the way over to the other side and get a better look, and the lead, you know, changes positions. That That's not a thing in two-person. So just be wary of how far you come over. Don't come over too far. And if the ball starts coming your way, start moving backward, as right. he does here. Now, he doesn't move as quick, but... I think this official is pretty aware of where he's at, where he's going. See how he's come back to his home position? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where the he's home, supposed to. The home yeah. position of the trail in a two-person is the same as three. It is the top of the three-point line extended. So he's in a good position. He comes down, the ball comes his way, and he can watch the shooter. Now, this is the trail's line, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, because it's his primary coverage area, so he is primarily responsible for the three-point line. Ball goes up, and he watches his shooter and stays with his shooter until he knows that that shooter is down and the defender is no longer pending any contact. He can then release his watch, okay? And by that, I mean, I'm going to move back just a little bit. Right, this this defender is coming down and could possibly run into the shooter. Do we agree? Good. We yeah. need to make sure if something does happen, maybe the maybe the shooter falls to the floor and maybe he flops. But if we didn't see the action, we don't know if he flopped or if he got hit. So we have to watch that shooter all the way. Now we know that it's clear and we can now focus and watch if the ball goes in there's any basket interference or goaltending. Okay. Now, again, this is why two person games are hard because there is so much you have to watch Absolutely. all at the same time. So does that make sense? Shooter goes up. You watch the shooter go up, come down is free and safe. And then we move to the ball going in. Absolutely. Correct. He did everything good. All right. So now we're watching for basket interference or goaltending. And then we see that the rebound was made and we head down the other end of the court. 
Does that make sense? Everybody followed that along? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Now yes. we've already talked a little bit already, but one point on that is don't be afraid to come toward the center of the court. Yeah, the only, the right. only thing, Josh, that I would be a little picky about on the trail is he, he put his hand up for the three, the left hand. He probably should have used the right hand. I'm not going to nitpick right now at this point. <laughs> but I mean, but you are right. You're right. We're taught to they put will say they want, you know, the hand the toward on. the table so the table can see the signal. Yeah. I, 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 I... Okay. So don't be afraid to come to the center to officiate. And again, too many of us, I'm one of them, get stuck in our spot and kind of just stand there and rotate our head this way and rotate our head that way. Maybe we take a step this way and take a step that way, but we have to really officiate the action, especially in those areas that are two person varsity games where the level of play is higher and you can't officiate across mm. the court. Okay. Let's talk about switching. Okay. Can anyone tell me before I play this video? Well, let me play it fast first. Did we do that correctly? I'm talking about switching. No. You should always mm, win. Yes. It was a non-shooting foul, correct? Correct. So there, right. he didn't have to switch. So when the, the book says all non-shooting fouls, you switch. You switch. Really? Yep. Now I realize he's right there. He turns. He reports. He turns yeah. back. Why? You know why waste the steps? I get that. But if and I've said this before. If you want to be seen, a lot of people probably wouldn't notice that. Even clinicians might just gloss over it. But if you want to be seen and be like, wow, this guy is doing it right, switch. Every foul, switch. And the reason for that, too, is they don't want one official making the same calls in the same areas, you know, for a long period of time. If you're switching, you're sharing the areas on the court. A non-shooting foul typically is staying in the front court. So they really want front court, you know, fouls to, okay, let's have a new guy in the new position. You understand that? Yep. So, so here's what, my thing on that. Let's so would you, would you report and then switch? Yes. 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 Yeah. yes. Like, like if, if, if the yeah. lead has a foul, is reporting a foul and he comes up, then you switch, he comes down and you switch at that point to report the foul, then he takes over and 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 the ball's out of, takes over at that point. But I, I like you just kind of blew my mind a little bit. And I understand you're you're right technically, because when we're taught we're taught, you know, in the beginning, hey, if we don't want to, and like a guy I officiated with his he had problems with his legs. He said, Hey, if if you don't mind us not switching too much, then you know, let's 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 not switch. But on on this particular issue, when we report, then we have to switch. Right, and it's important to switch again for fairness of the team. And yes, when you call your foul, even if you're table side right there in the reporting area, you need to report first. That is always first and foremost of anything right. that you do. Your partner should be getting, making sure all the other players are not getting into trouble. And then as soon as you're done reporting, your partner should initiate the switch to make sure that you do switch. You know, let's slow this down. I want to play this out. So we got a foul right here, right? Mm -hmm. So the spot is here on the floor, I would say. So the foul will be down. He said it's not shooting. Uh, we're not going to argue whether it is or not. He said it's not shooting. Okay. It's a non-shooting foul, so we know that we have to switch. Correct. All right, so the lead needs to initiate the switch by running over, and when <laughs> and when the, the official sees that he's running over, like, oh, yeah, okay, well, we can't have two people here, it forces the switch. So Derek, I think it was you, Derek, said, you know, there's a lot of guys that'll say, my knees aren't that great, can we not switch much? 
I guarantee you, if you run at your partner, <laughs> they're going to switch. Yeah, that's true. They may not like you all night, but, but they're going to switch. And I'm not suggesting do it anyway to tick people off. But um, you want to be seen doing it the right way. Josh? Yeah. In this case, in this, in this switch, in this rotation, the very probably, it's very probably the new leader, lead, Called foul again because he go for the stronger zone of change the area. Okay, so, I, so you're he saying foul switch and probably need call foul again because go for the lead zone. Now it's new lead. Is it because of the location of the foul? Is what you're saying? Yeah, because first call his trailer call foul. Okay, but he switch go for lead and probably who call more fouls the lead. In this case, because it's defensive foul. The, the trip. Okay, so and the trail. Call a game foul. You know what I mean? I, I understand what you're saying. Um, okay. <laughs> and, and in this particular situation, that might happen. And there's going to be other situations where that might happen. And the book yep. isn't saying we must always alternate fouls from all they're saying is if you stay here and he stays here and you make the fist fall, this call and you make that call. And you got this file and they're all in your air. Well, we need to switch. So yes, we could switch. And now he gets the file, this file down here, right? Mm -hmm. That's possible. But the point is to constantly be moving and switching because now you're watching a different area of the court. Does that make sense? There's plenty yeah. of games that I've been in where I've called three, four, five fouls in a row. It just happens to be that way. And you do the proper switching and it happens to be the way. And it, it stinks because it looks like I'm the one who's like, oh, this guy just wants to make all the calls when it's not really the case, but it doesn't negate the fact that we need to switch to make sure that it's covered. Because what if, what if I am the only one making, blowing my whistle? What if my partner is, is weak or shy or however you want to put it, the coaches want someone who's going to make that call. Right. It's not there fair for that call to not be called because the wrong official was in the in the area too many times. Does that make sense? I don't think coaches weigh in on this a lot, but when they do, they prefer to see switching. They would rather see switching knowing that yeah. you are trying to make it fair yeah. as they opposed want to different right. They want different perspectives. Yeah. And we've probably heard that in little kid games before where we don't switch much in little kid games, right? And then I've had coaches say, can you just switch once or twice? Like once in the quarter? Okay, you're right, coach. We'll switch. Some coaches, it means a lot. Most coaches probably don't notice, but... All right, let's move on to the next video. Josh, question yes. before we move on. What if... I don't know if it ever happens. Actually, I haven't, I haven't reffed once. But what if the lead had made that call and not the trail? Or the, is it possible that they make it together, coincidentally? If they have a double whistle? Yeah. Okay, so I don't think I have any videos of a double whistle, but I'll explain. Double whistle, who takes the call? Primary. Primary. Who's ever primary, primary yeah. that it happened in takes the call. So if I blow my whistle and my partner blows my whistle, we should both, first of all, be whistle aware, right? I've heard another whistle, so I'm not going to signal, sorry, charge. And he signals block, right? So we have that situation. We're going to be whistle aware, and then I'm going to look at my partner, get eye contact. Almost, and this all happens in a second. That's his area. I'm dropping my arm, and I'm just going to let him take it. Okay? Absolutely. And why do we make eye contact then? If I know that it's not my area, why, why do I even look at my partner? You because what if them. one has a foul and one has a violation? Now we've got two different <laughs> rulings out there, which could change on what we do. So then we might have to get together or one might just say, no, no, no I got it. There's a travel that happened before the foul, and then we can move on from there. So yes, the lead could have it along with it, but then we have to know, okay, it was the leads area or it was the trails area. You take it. That answer your question? Yes. Okay. And then second question, just if a follow up to that. What if let's say it's in the it's in the trail's primary, but the lead, but the trail wants a delayed whistle, and then the lead calls it early. So calls it ahead of the trail. So you're saying that the ball was in the leads area and there was a foul that needs to be gotten that the lead passed on. 
Correct. So for instance, there is a drive and it's going to result in a layup, but the lead calls it very quickly instead of the, the instead of waiting to see if there's going to be a basket from the layup and the kind of one. Well, as soon as the whistle is blown for a ruling, it's blown. There's no going and getting together and saying, well, you know what? The, he went up for the layup and he got the two points. We, let's let it go. If he blows his whistle, it's his call, his ruling, he takes it. Now, you can go into the locker room and you can talk later and say, hey, this is what I saw or what did you see? I would have probably let this go and talk it through. But you're going to find yourself in that situation too where someone makes a call. Maybe it's even right in front of you and you saw the whole thing and you passed on it for whatever reason. And then your partner comes and says, oh, I just, I, I thought you were straight line and you didn't see it. No, like it's my area. I, I got it. So you're going to have that, but just know it. If your partner blows his whistle, your partner's got a call. And if you're know that they're hundred percent wrong and the coach questions you, your partner got it right. Or you had the same thing, or you have to talk to him. I'm not sure what he saw or what, but we do not say, you know, sell him out and yeah, you're right coach. And right. that well, I would have passed and right. I know that's not what you're suggesting, but. Right. I mean, I know we're always a team anyway. All right. All right. Uh, let's move to another. Let's do a shooting file. There's no sound on this, so I apologize, but. Okay, do we do this correctly? All right. Yeah, the lead made the call. I mean, the trail made the call because she's still going. It's still the his call because she's going into the area, so he called it. So she's going into the area. He called it, reports the file. And he does the switch. It's a shooting so foul. Table side. Table side. It's yeah. a shooting foul. So should he have switched? No, he should not have. Okay. What about their positions on the floor? Well, they're in the wrong right place for sure. Well, I want to know when she shot it. <laughs> it <might have> been <laughs> <laughs> All right. You saw so that too, right? This I isn't a shooting it. or not shooting. Maybe it's bonus. I would say it looks yeah. like from the storeboard, it looks like the little bonus uh, light is lit up. I just want to say this. For those of you that don't watch a lot of NFHS Network, and Adam made a comment, they don't really give you video uh, audio. It's just the video. They give you this white over noise. And lots of times the time and the scores don't even ever match up to what's going on. I mean, look at the time now. One minute and 91 seconds. <laughs> so don't watch an NFHS network and make determinations based on what you see there. A lot of times it's not correct. It's 11 uh, up there. It looks like 1144 on the clock. That's probably like a clock. So anyway. In blowout games, you won't even see a score. Yeah. So let's move, let's move <laughs> back to, I'm going to play this slow and break it down. Because in a shooting foul, as we've already talked about a little bit, non-shooting fouls, excuse me, non-shooting fouls, we switch every time. But if it's a shooting foul, again, regardless of whether it is the trail or the lead, and regardless as to whether you're table side or not table side, it makes no difference. If you have a foul on a shooting foul, you report the foul and you stay table side. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't know why he was running down there. Okay, so he reports to the table, and he's right in the area. Don't get too close to the table, by the way. You don't need to get – that's still in the reporting area. A lot of guys like to go up really, really close. Okay. And then we should be staying table side, and our partner stays opposite table to administer the throw-in. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay? And I think they do that because – that's how they do it in three person. So it's a transition. And for the same reason they do it in three person, they want you there on that side. So if a coach has a question, he doesn't have to yell across the floor about it. And now we've got maybe technical foul situation um, uh, happening. So that's, I think, why they do it.
Okay, this is an out of bounds throw in situation. Ball goes out of bounds on the sideline. Clearly, he's out of bounds. Yes? Absolutely. Yes. And it's the Leeds line. So the Leeds got it. He knows it. He blows his whistle. The ball is going to be right there. Right there? Mm -hmm. Or does it go Not to the ball mark now? Goes up. Okay, before I let this finish, any yeah. out of bounds violation does not go to a 28 foot mark or a three foot mark. Okay, mm -hmm. out of bounds stays, the throwing stays where the ball went out of bounds. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Yes, yes, sir. We're going to make this mistake a lot this year because we're going to always be thinking 28 foot mark, 28 foot mark, but an out of bounds stays where it goes out of bounds. Okay, so this is a good throw-in spot. Where is the throw-in spot as we have marked here? It's below the free throw line extended, mm -hmm. which means the lead is going to administer <laughs> this throw-in. Okay? But we want to make sure we're off the floor when we do it. And I realize there's nobody over there where you're standing. But if you're on the court, knock them down, though. <laughs> yeah, because it came his way, right? They, they, they got close to knocking him down. <laughs> so we want to make sure we're off the court when we put it in. But this is the correct procedure. The lead always, and again, regardless of you're the lead or the trail, the official that blows the whistle on an out-of-bounds violation, it's their line, it's their throw-in. If you called the out-of-bounds, you administer the throw-in, always. Okay, except for when you're saving steps and all that stuff. But the book is, you blew the whistle, you administer. Hey, Josh. Yeah. I got a question on that. Okay. Um, uh, on that throw-in. Unless they <laughs> changed it, that lead should come up to the sideline and administer the ball from the sideline. And then... To drop down. The trail. Okay, so they the didn't trails. change. They didn't change it. That's the way it's always been. Right. To my understanding, maybe they did change it, and I just am understanding. But if the, and I don't know if I have a clip with this, but if the throw in is above the free throw line extended, then the lead would would become the new trail. Stay on that line. They would still administer the throw in, but they right. would come up and become the new trail and administer. But that's only when it's above the free above. throw line extended. Below the free throw line extended, they allow them to bounce the ball and stay on the end line as the lead. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people get yeah. confused with that. Um, and some of them say the trail just takes it and then they cross the court. They, they don't want you crossing the court either. They want you to stay on your line that you called. Hey, Josh, I have a question. Yeah. I thought that all throw-ins in the front court were at the 28-foot line or at the end line on the side of the lane line. I thought everything in the front court was like that, but you're saying no, if it's an out of bounds, when would the 28 foot line and the lane line throw-ins come into effect at a timeout? And fouls and timeout. Foul, that's foul. State, so, so, and, and we'll, we'll talk about this in two months, but any, any whistle that stops play that is not an out of bounds, okay? and the throw-in is in the front court. Right. Then we go to the four designated spots. So if it's going to be in a back court and they got to go into the new front court, it'll be closest to the, the foul or the violation. If it's a held ball and it's in the front court, that stopped play, it's not an out-of-bounds, it goes to a 28 or a three, okay? But an out-of-bounds always stays at the spot where it goes out-of-bounds. Gotcha. And again... We're all going to get this wrong a lot this year because we're all learning and, you know, trying to get used to it. All right. Um, What do you think I'm going to talk about in this one? This is not a good position to watch a play. 
Do we agree? Yeah, for sure. You never want to have to look over your shoulder. And even though we have to do it sometimes, especially in transition, here in the front court, turn your body. Square up to the, the play so you can see them. And you can move that way. You can move back and forth and side by side, right? Yep. You don't want to officiate looking this way. It, it just, it, it's harder to do and you don't see as well. Okay, that was a little snippet. Trying to get some more videos in here. Talking too much. I was also going to mention it might be a waste in two person to give the not closely guarded signal. I don't like to do that because there's so much going on. You're probably just wasting your time by doing that because you're based, you're just telling everyone I'm not officiating anything right now. So find something too. Okay. So here's my, here's my take on the clo not closely guarded. Uh, it, it definitely needs it, especially in those situations where they're trying to waste time. Right. We don't have shot clock in a lot of these games, at least in Illinois with the shot clock, it's less important, but if they're trying to waste time and the other team wants to still be, they want to guard them closely, but they don't want to get right in their face. Uh, we need to at least show it once. Right. So you give, okay, not closely guarded. And then you can drop your hands. And then if they start again, you count. And I was told whether you want to do this or not, once you give it once, you don't need to do it again. You don't need to keep doing it again. If you're not counting, they're not closely guarded. So I, I agree with you half-heartedly <laughs> that you shouldn't have to do it all the time because you do have to watch other things. And I think to Jacob's point, there's a lot to watch in a two-person game. So you don't want to focus just on this and now I got to watch this. And my secondary focus is now hurting because I'm putting 100% into these two players. Does that make sense? So good comment. All right, let's do this. A lead as a foul. And we're not disputing the foul again. That's not what this is about. Whether they fouled or not, the official ruled a foul. And it's right here is where they see the foul, which Toilet. is whose area? Toilet. Toilet. So what do you think this means the lead is doing? He's watching oh, the game. He should He's be watching, watching those watching. players, yes? Yeah, he should be watching the bottom of the basket. So what do you think the lead is doing? Ball watching. He's ball, ball watching. watching. Ball watching. That's not his call. It is even harder in a two-person game, I mean, it's not harder, but in a three-person game, you can get away with an official ball watching because you've got a third there to kind of help out, right? I'm not saying we should ball watch in a three-person either, but you take your eyes off of all the other players and now you're both watching the ball. I mean, that just can add up to a disaster. So you have to really train yourself to watch your area and be a partner aware and you can see that your partner's not watching it, then fine, you can move up there because you see your partner watching the other players. I'm okay with that. But you can't just kind of watch the ball and oh, I got it. Oh, you must've missed that. Well, you missed, you know, the other kid elbowing them in the mm -hmm. face that was mm -hmm. right in front of you because you weren't watching yep. it. <laughs> what happened here? He was like he was hesitant on his ruling of the call. Put the ball in at the wrong spot. Ball went out of bounds on a possible tip play over here. Yes. He gave right. a tip signal, tip, and it's going this way. Yeah. And I don't know, did I think, oh, uh, watch the coach. Watch the coach. He's going crazy. Maybe he heard the coach. Maybe a player said something to him, and he's now questioning whether he got it right or not. So he calls his partner over to talk about it, ultimately decides that what he called is going to stay that way, right? Yes. Okay, so what could we do here to make this better? 
first of all, I don't think I have any slower or any closer. Do we agree? That's close. I don't know who touched it. Mm-hmm. I would say probably went off a of light, but it's close enough. And he sold it. Did he not sell it? Yeah, he sold that. Okay. Did you see the nod from that official? Nope. I'm gonna I'm gonna back it up a little bit. The his partner comes in and nods his head. Okay, so he kind of agrees. And he walks away because he's ready to start. But he keeps calling him over. Now I don't like this. Because he's questioning himself. I mean, you already made the call. Now, I do like that he's getting and he wants to get it right. So I like that. And they they got together. And I think ultimately, in the end, ultimately, everyone's happy because he they didn't just like say it's mine. And, you know, you know, don't even talk to me. Right. They got together. So I do like that. But what I don't like is he tipped the signal to me that says I saw what happened sure. yeah. and we're going this way. You got it. And now you've lost all credibility by asking your your partner if no if your partner knows they got it wrong they're going to come running in blow their whistle come running in right your partner's walking away that either means that they agree with you or they have nothing to help you with changing the call right because the coach was like up in arms the kids were kind of up in arms i can imagine the fans are probably up in arms my partner's not coming to help me he either doesn't have any information for me or i got it right plus again i sold it like this Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't do this if I'm going to ask someone to come in and, and give me information. Okay. I'm not saying don't do this. If you want to sell your call and it was tipped and it went off of him. I think that's great. But then you've got to say, that's my call and I'm sticking with it. And you're, if you're going to get yelled at, you're going to get yelled at. In the story. We really don't know what he was saying though. He, no, he, we don't. He could have been telling his partner, Hey, the, the, the coach is screaming over there. This is what I saw. If he asked. Okay, so my he went back to his position and said we're we're playing ball. Okay, so Jim, my 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 advice to that is don't do that. Well, you don't need don't, to give your partner advice to talk to the coach and say, hey, just tell him what I saw. You'll eventually get to him and he can ask you if he wants to. Most coaches will go up in arms and complain, and the very next play they've forgotten and they moved on. Because most coaches don't really know either. They're giving their opinion just like you're giving your opinion. So I wouldn't go and give him information to relay to the coach. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just don't know what he said. So. Well, I don't know what he said either, but I can only assume, and obviously we're never going to know. But um, my point again is, if you're going to sell the call like you do, own the call and don't ask for help. Now, that doesn't mean your partner can't come in. And if he did come in, that means I'm thinking to myself, I saw a tip, but wait, maybe I saw it tipped wrong. I'm okay with you changing your call if your partner comes in and says that totally went off a white. Oh, okay, boop, we're going that way, right? But only my part. My partner's going to come in. I'm not going to call him over. I'm only going to call him over if I go, uh, I don't know, right? Hmm. Because if you don't know, you don't want to guess. So you're going to get your partner's opinion. And if they don't know, then what do you do? You stick with the call you made. No, you didn't make a call. You went tweet, help. I, I have no idea who it went off of. Your partner comes in and your partner says, I ain't. I don't have a clue either. What are you going to do? Ball. Yes? Well, then we're going this held way. Ball. Held ball. It's got to be a held ball. All right? It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, I'd rather have both coaches be mad at me and be <laughs> fair than one coach be mad at me and the other one think I'm an idiot because I got it wrong. <laughs> He did get it wrong. <laughs> I usually do. <laughs> All right, let me show one more. No, oh, good old Connecticut, filled with games for me. All right, now it looks like this clock matches up in this game. That's fantastic. All right, so it's third period, six minutes to go, and it's a 15 point game. Did you see what happened and what is happening? No. 
No. It's like you made a lot of time out. Thing. All right, hold on. I'm going to go back to the beginning, and I want you to watch the clock. Yeah, the lead, the lead circle the finger. The clock is started. working in this game. I know, you, <laughs> I know to tell you that to not use them, but it's working play. in this game. Yeah. When he blows his whistle, what happens? Clock starts like, when he blows like his whistle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so clearly oh, the yeah. clock oh operator. My God, what is going on here? They thought they started it and they thought they were stopping it when the whistle went. I get that. And someone brought to their attention that the clock was running. I don't know who. Is this correctable? With definite knowledge, which they don't have. You know, they put up. Where was it at? It was at 44. They put up 44. six seconds. Okay. Now, again, I don't know what they know, and I don't know what they've discussed. Let's just talk about this play. He just blew the whistle to grant a timeout. It hasn't been running this whole time, right? And neither one of them saw and, it. <laughs> and then it starts to run after he blows his whistle. The lead saw it. He was signaling. He was waving his finger in the air to run the clock. Right. But did the, is the lead watching this clock and counting this clock tick down? No, he's not. But he was signaling the table like to it. start the clock. Did you yeah, see him walking he like, clock you see walking like no big deal? <laughs> Nobody's watching this clock. Nobody knows how much time came off this clock. Now he realizes after he looked up. So can we fix this? Yeah. I mean, we clearly can fix it, right? If we have definite knowledge, yes? Yeah, absolutely. But yes. if we don't have definite knowledge, can we fix it? No. 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 I would say, in my opinion, all right, well, let me show you what the rule book says. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh. Right? If they have definite information, they changed that, by the way, because it used to say definite knowledge. Now it says if they have definite information, they can make an obvious mistake. Do they have definite information? <laughs> no. They don't know definitely how much time came off. Yeah, if they guess they six, <clears throat> what if only what if only mm -hmm. five came off or only four came off? Right? Is that fair? No. So don't guess. I would rather get yelled at. And I would say to the head coach, coach, it's your table. Right? They're the ones who made the mistake. What do you want me to do? As soon as I found it, I caught it, I stopped it. Now, I don't think these officials knew that it wasn't running that whole time. And if we're being no. honest, the time that ran off afterwards was probably about the same time that should have run off during regular <laughs> play. So if you do nothing, you're probably just as well off. So question, Josh. Yeah. So the, the official, the lead official actually signaled Clock's not running. He actually did it before the whistle. So he knew it wasn't running. And if he looked up at it, he saw it was 559. He went like this. I got to assume he knew it wasn't running. So could they just go back to that again and give him the ball again? One no. well, I'm watching the lead. I'm watching the lead. His goal is to go. Who's goal? Right there. Yeah, he, 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 yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah. I so he knew it wasn't running. Jim, to your point, we don't know for sure, but I agree with you. That probably was a, hey, start the clock, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. So what is your question before I put in my two cents? <laughs> so my, my question is, is it restartable back to the 559, give Red the ball again from wherever it was and say, hey, we, didn't, we, we weren't running the clock. That's our that's our restart. We haven't yet hit the clock a second time yet, so that's correctable after the first okay. interruption. Great, great question. Really great. The short answer is no. No, <laughs> they can't. And I will tell you why, at least in my practicality world. Then the next time they don't do it, are you going to go back again? And then the next time that they do it, are you going to go back again? You're going to be replaying game after game after game. You can't just keep correcting it. If you see the clock isn't running, one, you can count in your head. One, mm -hmm. two, three. Now you have definite knowledge of how much time should be coming off. You may use an official's count as definite knowledge. 
Okay. So if you see it's not running and then you're going like this, count in your head. So you know how much time should be coming off Two, I'm going to usually give, and I usually yell out clock, even in a varsity game, I might yell out clock maybe once. And if it doesn't start, <laughs> I'm blowing my whistle and I'm stopping play. I'm not going to let them continue to play for 10, you know, 12 seconds without the clock running. Yeah. And that, if you do that at a time when there's six minutes left, you'll be trained to do that when there's five seconds left. And you'll be way more attuned to the fact that we got to stop play right now and reset out. Cause then you can go back and say, we're going here or where, wherever you blow your whistle is where the ball is at is where you're supposed to go. We're going here and we're going to start at this time or I counted off five seconds, take five seconds off the clock or whatever knowledge you may have. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. But don't just watch it tick, 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 tick. Don't count in your head 15, 16, 17. If it doesn't start after three, four, five seconds, stop play and correct it. And usually, Josh, yes. If you were in the front court and you blew your whistle, would it be at the 28 foot or the three foot mark? Boy, that's a great question. Yes. Because you are stopping play. It is a whistle to stop play that is not an out of bounds. Right. Right? That, Even an official time have, out, you would put take it to, time to learn that. You yeah. would put it to the 28 mark, or you would put it to the three foot mark, depending where you are on the floor. Uh, Josh, I thought that ruling was defensive fouls in the front court. I'll read well, I'll read change you. it. They changed it, Josh. That's why I said the, the the comments on the rules that they initially put out and then what's in the actual rule book are different. It's, yeah, now, I'll, I'll... it's either foul or violation by either team. But then it also says, and the rule book says, any other stoppage. Correct. But the comments by the rules said any other stoppage <laughs> except for out of bounds. Correct. So the rule book doesn't say that. So I, I think it conflicts. So I think everybody's guessing right now. And until we actually see a case book or something else, I mean, I don't, I don't know how they're going to do it. Okay. The official rules book on my phone. It's released on the app. That is what we go by. We don't go by what they released earlier. We don't go by commentary or explanation. We go by what is written in the rules book. I can't go back 10 years and say, you know what they said in that pamphlet 10 years ago? All I can tell you is what the rules book says now. And so I go by what the rules book says. And to your point, I don't remember, I don't know who said that. It says defensive files, violations, or any other stoppage of play other than out of bounds. Okay. And that's what that was, a stoppage of play, right? And it wasn't an out of bounds. Yeah. And again, they do it, I think, just so. Why, why are you going to have them in the corner? Why are you going to have them, you know, all the way? Just put them in a spot so we can start play. It lessens the chance of people getting hurt when they run those plays in the corner and everyone's congested. They just want to make things smoother and flow easier. All right. Do I have a bonus play? Do you guys want a bonus play? Sure. Oh, yes. yes, sir. Absolutely. Here's our bonus play. It's a technical foul play. And again, it's this is meant for two person for positions and whatnot, but here it goes. Okay, lead calls a technical foul. I can only assume the coach said he sucked. <laughs> <laughs> all right they got together court to figure out what they're doing they're shooting the free throws he's talking to coaches or something i don't know what he's doing and they put the ball in play give it to the wrong team yeah give it to yeah. the wrong team yeah what happened Ubar. okay so First of all, I want to make the comment of, let's go back here, go all the way through. Where should the ball be thrown in at? Midcourt. Opposite, opposite the table. Court. Opposite and who, table. Does, and who does the ball go to? White. 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 The White. team that was offended, right? Absolutely. The, the technical foul was on black. We don't give it back to black. In high school, it is always two free throws <laughs> and a throw one at the division line. Always, I'm unless, powerful. you know, there you've got simultaneous, right? But so it's not, I think what they did here was point of interruption, but in high school, it's never that. Okay. It and I actually, I talked to the official and, and he said, <laughs> they screwed it up. He yeah. said the other official 
was adamant and he was new and wasn't sure. And so he just went with it. And that happens. I get it. And you know what? Nothing probably happened bad in this game because of it, but let's learn from it. Um, so we know next time, because the whole point of a technical foul is you need to be penalized as harshly as possible. You don't get the ball back. You can't act that way and expect to get the ball back. Neither one of the coaches said anything. I mean, like, really? <laughs> I think that might be why the official is walking over here just to say, I don't know. I don't know what he's doing, but this is the other thing that I want to say. Okay. You see the lead down there. looks like he's getting ready to bounce the ball to the player. But what is his partner doing? Who knows? In the middle of the court. The ball. He's walking to the middle of the court to try and address somebody. We need to see that my partner is not ready. Okay. Did he blow his whistle? I don't know. Let's see that. I'm going to see if he blows his whistle. I don't think so. I've never seen this before. No, he's just trying to talk to the, tell him to get in his coach's box or something. But then as he's in the middle of the court, the lead bounces the ball and it's now in play. <laughs> he's one of the players. Okay. So we have to know where our partner is. Even if our partner is, maybe he's being an arrogant a-hole, right? And we don't like what he's doing and we want to get started. And what are you doing? Even if that's the case, we cannot start with him on the floor. No. Right. So if you have to like blow your whistle and, and say, Hey, we're ready to go. And you can maybe do that, but don't start it when he's trying to talk to someone else, because it's not about whether he's on the floor might get in the way. I mean, it is about that, but it's about, he's not paying attention. He just saw that miss that kid throw the elbow after the technical foul. Cause he got pissed and he's going to get his due. Right. And because you're official, your partner's not watching, you didn't see it. So we have to make sure that we're always. And, and uh, for God's yeah. sake, don't bounce him the ball on the end line. You can bounce the ball on the end line. Yeah, as long as there's no pressure. They changed that it. last year, I think. I think it was oh, yeah. last year. If there's no pressure, right, you can bounce it, which mm -hmm. we should be able to bounce it all the time, in my if opinion. But... Pressure. Um, let me show next month's schedule. <clears throat> so we can all prepare. What is next month? October. October 12th. October. It's the second Thursday of the month, as always. It's going to be at 7 o'clock, as always. And we're going to talk about protecting the shooter. Primarily closeout fouls. Does everyone know what a closeout foul is? When I go up for the when shot, box out and on the perimeter, button. and a player comes in to box you out and puts their foot in, you know, where the other player lands on your foot or they contact him with their rear end or, you know, we got to let the players come down mm -hmm. safely. We talked a little bit about that today, but we're going to deep dive um, a little bit deeper into it next month um, because we need to protect the shooter. All right. Well, thanks for coming guys. Josh. Thanks. Josh. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Mary, yeah, take care, I'm Josh. up. See you, Jimmy. Right. See you later, Josh. I'll later, see guys. you guys. All right. See you, Josh.